Well, welcome everybody. My name is John Tisubis. I'm the director of the Yo Chong Lei Center for Politics, Philosophy and Law. And this event on the migration crisis is one that we're very happy to do in collaboration with the philosophy department here at King's. And in particular, um, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Sarah Fine, who's been instrumental in getting this event um, together. Um, I'll simply begin by introducing our panelists who are going to give us a multidisciplinary perspective on this very important topic. Um, so beginning from my extreme left and progressively closer to me, um, Catherine Costello, who's the Andrew W. Mellon Associate Professor of International Human Rights and Refugee Law at the University of Oxford. Dr. Sarah Fine, who's a lecturer in philosophy here at King's College London. Matthew Gibney, who's Professor of Politics and Forced Migration at the University of Oxford. And Maya Mailer, who's Head of Humanitarian Policy and Campaigns at Oxfam. And we've agreed that the format will be each one of our panelists will speak for 10 minutes, and then we will throw it open to general discussion. Um, invite questions and comments um, from everybody here. So I think the running order is um, Maya first. So whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. So I've been asked by Sarah to give the view from the field. Um, I've been to Jordan and Lebanon um, several times this year, and I'm going to paint a picture of what's happening beyond Europe. Understandably, we're very much focused on the scenes of um, refugees arriving to Europe, but we need to remember that the, the vast majority of refugees are hosted not in Europe, but in poor um, and middle-income countries. So around 90% of Syria's refugees are spread across Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Iraq. Um, and I'll be focusing on, on Jordan and Lebanon and um, where Oxfam has some programs. So in Jordan, you have 620,000 refugees. Um, some of them are in the sprawling Zatari refugee camp, which is now the fourth largest city in Jordan. And in Lebanon, it's a tiny country, it's about the size of Wales, there are 1.2 million refugees. So that's one in every five residents um, in Lebanon is a refugee from Syria. So if you can imagine, that's the equi equivalent of the UK suddenly taking in 16 million Europeans quite suddenly. So I think that puts our commitment to resettle 20,000 refugees over the course of five years into perspective. So unsurprisingly, in Jordan and in Lebanon, the country's infrastructure is buckling under the strain of this huge influx. And I think what is not known necessarily um, is that the majority of refugees aren't living in formal camps that are run by international aid agencies. They're actually living among and near the poorest um, Lebanese and Jordanian communities. Um, and in Lebanon, this is a deliberate government policy not to, have camp, not to have formal camps. It's wrapped up in the history of the Palestinian issue, but also because they don't want to encourage um, settlement. Um, and in Jordan, you do have formal camps, but refugees seek to live outside them in the hope that they'll, they'll gain work and, and, and at least in theory have, have a bit more freedom. So what this means is that Syrians are using the local services. They're relying on the schools, on water, on electricity, on, on, on the healthcare. And if you take the example of schools, they're overflowing at the moment um, in Syria and Jordan. The authorities are running double shifts to accommodate um, the refugee children. And despite many acts of solidarity and support, community tensions are rising in those countries. And even though there were problems before the influx of Syri Syrian refugees, the local population is quick to blame the refugees for rising unemployment and for the strain on services. And locals also feel that their aid efforts is um, unfairly targeting refugees when they, the host population, are also struggling to get by. And the point is it's not only a social or a political issue for these countries, it's also deeply political. Um, I was in Lebanon just last month and I spent some time talking to a family in a so-called informal tented settlement. 
not even allowed to use the word camps. They're basically like mini refugee camps, but it's too sensitive to use that term. Um, so you've got a collection of about 20 or 30 tents in a muddy, barren field. I was sitting inside with the refugee family. Um, they had their mattresses piled up in the corner, so at night time they'd take, take the mattresses out so the children can sleep there. There was a colourful carpet in the, on the floor. There was a real attempt to create a sense of normality, um, to create a sense of normality for their children. Um, the father told me that they'd been there for four years. So while their tent was, you know, they tried to make it cosy, they were still living um, under tar tarpaulin in a tent in the Bakar Valley where the temperatures drop below freezing. It's cold in the winter. The children were running around and he told me that none of the children go to school. There is a local school, but they don't have enough money to buy uniform for their kids. And they're worried that if they turned up at school, they'd be taunted and harassed, so they just stay within this little settlement. Another thing I think is not necessarily known is that the majority of refugees in Jordan and Lebanon are paying rent. They're paying rent to private landlords. Um, Lebanon and Jordan haven't signed the Refugee Convention, and actually they refer to the refugees as displaced people, again, for political reasons. So you're basically paying for the luxury of being a refugee. So how do you pay your rent to these private landlords? So you've got organizations like Oxfam that are delivering aid, but it's just not enough to meet the scale of need. So you draw down your assets, but five years on, most of those have dwindled. When I was there earlier this year, an elderly grandmother said, I've sold everything, I've sold my last pair of earrings, and I don't know how, how I'm going to pay, pay the rent when um, in a few weeks' time. So you try to work, but your right to work is heavily restricted or in fact it's criminalized. So now refugees who um, ar arrive in Lebanon actually need to sign something, sign a pledge saying that they will not work in order to gain their residency. So this is cause creating a very, very difficult situation. Um, refugees are trying to keep a low profile because they're so nervous about their legal status in the country. If they do work, they can be shaken down for bribes. There are reports of increasing child labor and of women being married off, married off early. So it's one of enormous strain on the countries themselves and refugees facing really incredible hardship. hardship. And what always strikes, strikes me when I go is just narrowing choices. You can't go home because the conflict is still raging in Syria. Um, it's getting tougher by the day where you are, and the prospects for re being resettled to a third country like the US or the UK are just so, so slim. So that, I would say, is the true definition of a refugee crisis. By contrast, in Europe, you have an estimated 900,000 arrivals by sea since the beginning of this year, and that's equivalent to less than 0.2% of the EU's population. And just to be clear, for the refugees and migrants that are arriving, it is absolutely a crisis. I've been to South Sudan, I've been to Eastern Congo, I've been to lots of places, but every time I see those images from Greece, it shocks me. We have boatloads of people who are um, arriving in Greece. Some of them don't even know which country they've arrived in. They're sopping wet, they make a terrifying journey at night, and they're the lucky ones because they're su they've survived. They're then trekking through countries in the cold. You've got children sleeping outside. I mean, these really truly are extra extraordinary scenes, but they're not inevitable. Um, the, the European Union does have the ability to make sure that the needs of refugees and migrants, it is a mixed migration flow, but you know, whether you're a refugee or a migrant, your basic human rights need to be upheld and your basic needs need to be met. And if, the, if Europe was to offer safe and legal routes, people wouldn't be forced into the hands of smugglers and they wouldn't have to make these perilous journeys. Because you only put your kids into a boat like that because you're absolutely desperate. You're not doing it through choice. So I'd say that here in Europe we're experiencing a political and a moral crisis, but not a material crisis. Um, so just a few words on the UK government and what they've been doing. So the UK has, a, has been very proactive as a donor in the region. It's one of the top donors. 
And there is now kind of a welcome, if very belated, recognition that you need to do much more than give humanitarian aid, but you actually have to help countries like Lebanon and Jordan over the long term to build up their infrastructure so they can meet the needs of both refugees and their own poor populations. But I think there is certainly a perception in the region that what is driving that policy is not so much the welfare of refugees and poorer communities, but an attempt to prevent people from coming to Europe. And this is part of a much bigger picture where development assistance risks being used or misused or instrumentalized to prevent mobility. Um, so aid that should be used for poverty reduction is going to be used to, control, um, to shore up borders um, in Africa and elsewhere. When we speak to the government, they say that you know, they're providing aid to the region, and that it, but that doesn't absorb, and they, but they do so because it's more cost effective and because you have to help refugees where they are. But we, I think at Oxfam and many other charities would say that that doesn't absolve you from your moral obligation to welcome refugees. And it's not just a moral issue, it's actually a practical issue. If you as, um, if you as the UK government are putting pressure on much poorer countries to improve their quality of as asylum, to open up their labor markets to refugees, then you have to be seen to be doing your, your, fair, your fair share yourself. And that, that's the feedback certainly we get from speaking to authorities in big refugee hosting countries. And then the final point is just to say that I've spoken a lot about Syria, but of course this goes way beyond Syria. Um, they make up, I think Syrians make up about 50% of the people arriving in Europe, but you also have Afghans, Iraqis, Eritreans. Um, and one of the th th trends that we need to be really alive to is that it looks like Syrians are actually getting prefer preferential treatment when they arrive in Europe, and, and, and that is also worrying. And beyond Europe, you have 60 million displaced people. Most of those actually are displaced within their own borders. Um, and then most of refugees, as I said, are being hosted by the poorer and middle income countries. So when we're discussing this, we have to not be too Eurocentric because um, the real strain is not being borne by Europe. Thanks, Maya. So there's a logic to the progression of speakers. We're going from being rooted in facts onto law, onto policy, and then the eternal perspective of philosophy with the sharer. So the next speaker is Catherine, who will give us the legal analysis. Great. Uh, thank you very much, John and Sarah and, and Maya, for setting up that discussion. And I think that reminder that refugees are predominantly not in Europe, um, but hosted in countries under much greater material and economic strain is something that we just we have to bear in mind. Um, I don't think we'd be discussing this as a crisis, on the other hand, if we weren't seeing large arrivals to Europe, and so that is my focus, but I'm very much mindful that um, the system for protecting refugees in international law is actually premised on the idea that uh, the whole reason we have a particular convention dealing with refugees is that it's refugees become a matter of international concern. So the preamble to the Refugee Convention says that the grant of asylum may place unduly heavy burdens on states, and it imagines a world in which then there will be international cooperation. So with that in mind, mine is a legal analysis, but I'm very much going to highlight some deficits, I think, which suggest that maybe the law is part of the problem, so that there are gaps in the law or failures, which are things that we should critique from an ethical perspective and also identify the political failures, particularly failures of cooperation, um, and then hand over to my colleagues in politics and philosophy to fix those problems for us. <laughs> uh, so, three things that I'm gonna do. Uh, refugee or migrant, and really doesn't matter. Um, it matters in law because we have a regime of obligations towards refugees, but as was mentioned, the main host countries for Syrian refugees haven't ratified that particular so, you know, we have to ask if that question has different salience and different resonance in different places. Um, why dangerous journeys? And there I'm just going to give a sketch to explain well, that that's a legal problem with a legal solution to it. Um, and then briefly assess some of the current responses. So the question refugee or migrant, I guess just with as a refugee lawyer, I will answer that question by 
kind of contextualizing the question of who's coming at the moment. So this infographic, which I check regularly, is from the UNHCR's monitoring system. We have the number of arrivals by sea in 2015, the number of dead or missing, and as they describe it, 84% of these people come from the world's top 10 refugee producing countries. So we can draw a very crude sketch saying, you know, if you've come from Syria, you're definitely fleeing war. Um, and in UNHCR's view, you fall within the refugee definition of the 1951 convention. Uh, when we see the nationalities arriving, as Maya mentioned, um, and these are focusing on the boat arrivals. So there are other people who come to Europe in seeking asylum, but this is really the most significant route this year. Over half of them are Syrian. On the route from Turkey to Greece, it's you know, over 60% of the people coming that way are Syrian, Afghans, Iraqis, Eritreans, and then a number of other nationalities. Um, I want to highlight some of the questions that arise out of this in my talk, because what, one of the things that we see when we look at who's actually getting legal protection in EU countries is that while Syrians, Iraqis, and Eritreans are generally, and I say in very high percentages, say over 75, 80, in some countries 90% getting some kind of legal status, there's a different sort of framing of the protection needs of Afghans that I wanted to highlight. Not because, I mean, obviously there are questions about the conditions in Afghanistan, but I want to highlight it as a normative question about relying on nationality as sort of a too crude proxy for assessing protection needs, which is, I think, a feature of the current crisis too. So the refugee definition you're probably all familiar with, it speaks about persecution and persecution on particular grounds related to an individual's political opinion, membership of a particular social group, which could be gender or sexual identity, um, and so on. Um, I think there has often been a misperception that if you're fleeing war, that's not persecution, or if you're fleeing war, that there's no nexus to a political ground. Um, and both of those are legally incorrect assumptions. And actually, in the current practice, we're seeing quite a move away from that view that a conflict refugee is somehow a different type of refugee to a convention refugee. And partly that's because UNHCR has done a very good job of pointing to the political context of the Syrian conflict and saying, this is not um, indiscriminate violence. We have people being targeted because of their political opinion, their imputed political opinion according to where they live and so on. So the UNHCR view has very strongly made a claim that these conflict refugees are in fact um, also convention refugees. And some states in Europe have been recognizing that and so giving Syrians uh, convention status. In EU law we also have an additional head of protection called subsidiary protection which also protects people fleeing indiscriminate violence. So in some countries, the pattern's a bit different. Um, the, I guess what's interesting to compare now with, say, previous refugee crises in Europe would be if we look back to the Balkan Wars, there was very much a practice of temporary protection, saying, yes, some people might be convention refugees, but states are going to use a different mode and just use a temporary protection mechanism, which actually exists in EU law if states wanted to hasn't been, for reasons I can uh, discuss in more detail later, hasn't been actually activated. So in that sense, we've got a refugee crisis. And I guess from a UNHCR operational perspective, even in countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, which um, aren't fully subject to the refugee convention, it's a refugee crisis. And we see this in the pattern of recognition across Europe, as I mentioned. Um, but one point I wanted to make in terms of the framing is that there has been just this, and I mean, maybe it's not all that salient anymore, but quite a big discussion, particularly in the UK, about, well, is it the right label to use? Um, and there's an idea which is reflected in this quote here, which is the UNHCR handbook, which just affirms a basic idea in international law, that you're not made a refugee when a state recognizes you as falling within these definitions, that your material circumstances are what makes you a refugee. And interestingly, that's the absolute converse of the BBC position, which now the BBC has explained to us on its website. Uh, but in my fourth complaint to the BBC of recent times, um, I was actually complaining that they were translating the German word Flüchtling in the context of a discussion of the German Flüchtlingszentrums that were being set up as refugee 
uh, as they were translating the word piffling as migrant, which seemed to suggest an even stronger and willful misconstruction of the issue. But I just wanted to note that question of terminology. So a refugee crisis, but clearly the idea of the refugee regime is that refugees may flee to neighboring countries, but that's just the beginning. There are international cooperative duties these may not be legally enforceable, but they're part of the refugee regime. Um, I think the difficulty is that what we've seen is that those duties are very difficult to allocate and implement. So the crisis of dangerous journeys, which is really the hallmark of the humanitarian crises in Europe, particularly in Greece and along the Balkan route, is one that is legally created. So if you want to come to Europe legally, you need a visa, if you're a Syrian or from the Middle East. You don't need a visa if you're from the Balkans. So people from the Balkans come to Europe, they claim asylum, they get rejected and they get deported, but they don't die in the process. Okay? They can take a land route, they don't need to get their papers checked. Um, so we have set up a system where to claim asylum you have to be on the territory. And for years there's a whole body of work critiquing the fact that there is this disjuncture, saying yes, asylum is available, but we won't give it to you unless you're on the territory to claim it. So this gives you a little bit of a snapshot. Before the war started, if you were Syrian, you could apply and have a fairly good shot of getting a Schengen visa to come to the EU legally. As soon as war breaks out, the mere existence of war means that you are presenting a risk of overstaying your visa because claiming asylum is overstaying. It's indicating that you're not just coming on holiday. You're not just coming for that short trip. So by definition, the visa system has this built into it. Visas are not available for people who would claim asylum. That's a legal problem with a legal solution. The reason that not having a visa means you have to take a deadly journey is something different though, because that comes about because of carrier sanctions, so, which exist in domestic and EU law. So if you, uh, which basically means we've externalized and privatized border controls. Again, this is not a new story, but maybe it wasn't properly understood before this <coughs> so the result is that the ferry from Turkey to Greece, which would cost you 15 euros, you cannot board as a refugee or somebody who has the intention or even the entitlement to international protection in Europe, and you have to take an irregular journey. Um, which leads to this situation where you have you know, now over 700,000 people using this Turkish Greek route, all of them paying over 1,000 euros each. A crude calculation would put the revenues of smugglers in Turkey at over 7 billion euros, which puts the, you know, the 3 billion in the EU-Turkey aid deal in contrast. In fact, 7 billion is more than the entire European asylum migration and integration fund for five years. So, and this is the people that Maya described who are already eking out an existence and have sold a lot of their belongings, making that final decision to um, you know, give their last resources to smugglers. So the alternative would be, well, there are many, humanitarian visas or easing up on carrier sanctions. And to me, this was the spoof of the summer, but there's almost something heartbreaking of it. As somebody hacked Ryanair and created a Ryan Fair website, announcing that Ryanair had found a social conscience and was going to fly refugees, at least from Greece elsewhere in Europe. Because remember, this dangerous journey doesn't stop in Greece. It means from Greece along the Balkan route, you're still irregular. You have no right to get to Germany to claim asylum there. Um, and all carriers do is risk a fine if they were going to take this. But that risk of a fine is enough <coughs> to basically create an impenetrable barrier for somebody whose papers aren't in order. So this story, again, is not new. But it's so much part of the humanitarian crisis, because the humanitarian crisis in Europe is a crisis of dangerous journeys. It's not a crisis of humanitarian need. We are not a continent in, in where there is famine or generalized want. You know, it's one of the most prosperous regions of the world. So the solutions are many, but they're all about migration, altering migration controls, resettlement can be a solution, humanitarian visas, so on. So there's nothing new in this. This is the EU's own fundamental rights agency urging these moves. There's even an argument that humanitarian visas are a legal duty and there's, you wouldn't even have to change anything in EU law for countries to issue humanitarian visas.
And at the moment, one of the only countries that does is Brazil. So again, an Iraqi refugee in Turkey could go to the Brazilian embassy and get a visa which would allow them to travel and then claim asylum on arrival. So, you know, this is not something that would be legally problematic. There are questions about due process and how you would organize it, but they're operational questions. So that's the crisis of dangerous journeys, and the responses thus far have not addressed that element of the crisis. And really, we're in a moment where the countries that could see the logic of starting to issue humanitarian visas are the ones that are bearing the brunt of the arrivals, like Germany, with possibly up to a million asylum applications this year. And so for them, there is a sense that, well, humanitarian visas, yes, but only if we're going to contain the irregular flow. We can't do both. I mean, this is the explanation I heard the last time I was in Berlin from you know, officials who are sincerely coping with and, and managing these numbers of arrivals. You know, they can see the logic of humanitarian visas, but not if they're the only country that's going to issue them, right? And not if there's still going to be this irregular um, movement. Um, instead, what, so what we've seen, if I had to summarize responses, is that protection, you know, and actually refugee protection, refugee status, which is kind of surprising to me that there wasn't a decision to use temporary protection in the more ad hoc mechanisms. But really, it's mainly, almost overwhelmingly, about Germany and Sweden. Other countries have a, a significant, and I think getting more significant, increase in asylum applications, but not that many. Some people think we've seen the death of the Dublin system, which would have allocated responsibility to states in a particular way. We can discuss that. Very selective resettlement. I mean, the UK's paltry 20,000 is probably just the most emblematic. Um, and a commitment to relocate asylum seekers, only ones with strong claims from Italy and Greece, uh, but it hasn't worked so far. A commitment to relocate 160,000, maybe a couple of hundred have been relocated so far, one flight from Italy and two from Greece. So that hasn't worked in practice. Uh, and new forms of containment. Um, and so the war on smuggling, a UN Security Council even secured to um, engage in new forms of military action in the central Mediterranean, but very much focusing on smuggling from Libya. And of course the EU-Turkey deal, which so far, at least on paper, looks like it's all about containment. There's a small nod to burden sharing where the EU states remind Turkey that they've already resettled some people from Turkey. Um, but no commitment to major resettlement. So the big international conference on Syrian or let's say Middle Eastern refugees hasn't happened. I would imagine that 2016 will be the year, but you know, to be meaningful, resettlement has to be in large numbers. Otherwise, it's just another containment strategy. It's false hope so people will stay put in countries of the region. And so there's a real, and maybe that was the point on which I would conclude, I think the resettlement that we talk about, which means people who are acknowledged as refugees but are living in neighboring countries, being offered a new place to live, um, is really double-edged. So it can be just a containment strategy, and often in protracted refugee situations, this is the role of containment. It's a glimmer of hope so that people will stay in a system whereby they're aid dependent from UNHCR if they're going to get resettled, they get assessed twice over by UNHCR and by the state of resettlement. Highly selective and based on highly manipulable is that a word? Uh, criteria of vulnerability. So to be an, a response to the current crisis, you would have to have resettlement in large, in, at a large scale as genuine responsibility sharing. Where people's needs would be assessed quickly, you would have a lot of coordination, which is why resettlement is generally something that comes out of a large conference. Um, and we have historical examples, which get cited a lot to show it's not just that we should do this, but we can do this. There are capabilities that are already in existence. And we've seen a bit of this since the election of Trudeau in Canada, where reaffirming Canada's justly proud tradition of refugee protection was an election issue. You know, the family of Elan Kurdi had tried to get to Canada and their application just got stuck, um, and uh, they gave up hope. Um, and so you can use resettlement as a tool of SWIFT and um, to, to give people access to a better life. Um, but I think without the coordination of a 
a conference, it was difficult to imagine a situation in which states are going to really open up uh, resettlement places that would be commensurate with not only refugee needs, but also with addressing the kind of chronic situation in host countries, where, you know, as Maya described, the situations in Lebanon and Jordan just seem, you know, like, I mean, a recipe for a disaster in the longer term, in terms of a generation growing up without hope or without education. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. So now we move on to a political perspective from Matthew Gibney, also from Oxford. Thank you, and thanks Sarah for organising this and John for chairing. Um, in the short amount of time that I have, um, I want to um, normatively reflect um, on the topic of how states should um, respond to the current crisis of refugees in Europe, just taking into account uh, the definition of a crisis, which we've heard in some ways called into question a humanitarian crisis, at least. And my way into this will be merely to offer some um, reflections on three assumptions that have underpinned the UK's recent um, reluctant and limited uh, response to what's going on in Europe. These assumptions are, first, uh, that many people currently on the move are not refugees, but simply people in search of a better life. Second, that uh, funding humanitarian assistance in the region is an adequate substitute for the provision of asylum here in the UK. And the third is that genuine, genuine refugees remain in the first safe country that they come to. Now, the first assumption of, say, the Cameron government, though it could have easily been shared by many governments uh, before it, um, to providing asylum has been that many of those on the move within Europe are simply not refugees, but migrants, as I said, in search of a better life. And this assumption obviously requires that we have a clear idea of who a refugee is. Now, the dominant definition, as we have been made um, and in a very sophisticated way by Catherine is provided by the Geneva Convention where a refugee is defined as someone with a fear of persecution on certain specified uh, grounds. Um, but interestingly enough, when uh, political theorists or moral philosophers are asked to define what a refugee is, they virtually never land upon this definition persecution and a specification of various grounds. Instead, they tend to define a refugee simply as someone who is on the move because his or her fundamental human rights are being violated at home. Now, um, my colleague Alex Betts has recently captured this point by employing um, Henry Hsu's idea of basic rights, which uh, Hsu defined as rights without whose protection other rights cannot be enjoyed. That's what made them basic. Refugees then, at least in this perspective, are people who cannot stay at home because their basic, that is their liberty, security and subsistence rights are threatened where they are. Now the main um, difference between this definition and the Geneva Convention, and of course um, uh, legal scholars are, are very good and creative at expanding out just what the uh, Refugee Convention can include. Um, so, um, so one needs to take that into account. But the main difference between this definition and the Geneva Convention is that in the, um, in the Geneva Convention, it matters why one has lost one's human rights. It has to be on certain specified grounds, such as race, religion, membership of, of a particular social group. You have to, you have to um, create that kind of nexus. From a moral perspective, however, this looks somewhat arbitrary. Surely it's the fact that someone's rights are violated that matters, not the reasons for the violation. And the Geneva Convention see, um, definition seems rather insensitive to rights violations that, straight, um, that stem from indiscriminate violence, which can occur in cases of war, and from structural change, such as economic collapse within a country. One might give an example 
Now, there have been attempts, um, attempts to defend the Geneva Convention definition morally. For example, the international lawyer um, Jim Hathaway has argued that convention refugees are special because of the fact that they are picked out, sorry, um, sorry, let me just say that again, because, because they are picked out as unwanted people makes it less likely that they, unlike forced migrants generally, um, from economic collapse or say civil war, will ever find protection in their country of origin. According to Hathaway, the fact of the refugee, the convention refugees, social marginalization, that they are actually picked, at, um, picked upon or persecuted on grounds of race or um, religion, makes convention uh, refugees the most deserving of deserving forced migrants. Now, I find this argument a bit dubious for um, a number of reasons that I don't have time to go into here, but we could talk about that later. But even if it is right, it clearly doesn't support the position that those who fall outside the convention are not owed um, asylum. And once we recognise this, we have, I think, good reason to be sceptical of the very casual identification that uh, many people, many people in politics, um, uh, make of the fact that, uh, um, claim that many people currently on the move across Europe are simply economic migrants or just in search of a better life. Now, the second linchpin of the Cameron government's refugee approach has been to argue against resettling refugees because the UK is already doing its share by being the largest funder, and it is by a small bit, um, of humanitarian aid in <laughs> Syria and, um, and um, around there. By the end of last month, the UK had allocated some 1.2 billion pounds of funding for this humanitarian crisis. And this, of course, is no mean figure. But is the Cameron government right to think it can donate its way out of providing asylum? Well, perhaps. If states agree amongst themselves to establish a kind of division of labour in terms of dealing refugees, it might be acceptable. But the difficulty seems to be that the UK has acted pretty much arbitrary, unilaterally here without the consent of, um, um, of um, other states in substituting aid for um, asylum. And this is an issue because there's no objective answer to how much aid a state would need to donate to relieve itself of duties to provide asylum. This is exactly the kind of issue on which one would want agreement by states, especially because individual states can easily exaggerate their own contribution. But a deeper concern is that the obligation to provide asylum is not fungible. Taking in refugees can transform a society in ways that mere donations do not. Providing money tends to be a one-off act. Providing asylum creates an ongoing um, responsibility for a state. Um, an act with, um, with some risk because the consequences for the society that the refugee enters could be profound and are unknowable in um, advance, especially when large numbers of people are um, involved. Now, because the burdens of asylum involve unique risks and uh, responsibilities, one might reasonably feel that any state that does not provide asylum cannot really consider itself fully part of the common enterprise of helping refugees. Other, st other states might say to the UK, it is wrong for you to subcontract your uh, moral responsibility to um, take refugees to um, other countries and to expect the citizens of um, other countries to carry the primary burdens and risks of uh, resettlement. Now, I've just paraphrased the words of David Cameron, but his words come not from a discussion of refugees, but from his statement of why the UK ought morally provide military forces 
and not simply technological support in the fight against Daesh in uh, Syria. And if it's important in the case of conflict to take a share of the risks, I put it to you that it's also important in the case of providing asylum. Which brings me to a final um, assumption. The UK has recently, under pressure, of course, committed itself to uh, resettling some refugees. But it's decided to take only refugees from camps in the conflict region. And the government has given a number of reasons for um, doing this. That the refugees in the region tend to be more vulnerable. That it doesn't want to encourage people to travel to uh, Europe. But lurking in the background here, I think, is another assumption that true refugees just accept asylum wherever they can find it, and thus that those currently moving into Europe are somehow doing something illegitimate or something that is inconsistent with being a refugee. Now, interestingly, this position draws some indirect support from recent normative theorists of migration who have argued, as I've already suggested, that all the international community owes to the refugee qua refugee is a secure place of uh, protection, a place where their basic rights will be respected. But this view, I think, overlooks some other important interests that uh, refugees have. To be a refugee um, is not simply to be an uh, individual who has lost the protection of his or her basic rights, it is to be someone who has lost her entire social world. It is to be someone who has been displaced from the communities, associations, relationships, and cultural contexts that tend to shape one's identity and around which one organizes one's life plan. We see this in the desperate efforts of refugees to get to countries they judge most conducive to the rebuilding of their social world. Places where they have family, cultural connections, opportunities to work. And just what makes a suitable asylum country is, um, is um, always going to depend on the particular refugee in question. For some, that country is going to be Lebanon, for some, the UK, for some, Germany. Should states accommodate, then, these uh, individual preferences? Well, it's helpful here, I think, to think of a domestic analogy to the refugee. Think of a child endangered by parental abuse, which involves a breakdown in the normal functioning of the family. Um, in such a case, the, state, um, the state's immediate, um, immediate duty is to remove the child from uh, harm, perhaps by placing her into the safety of children's home. Yet once the child has faith, um, has uh, found safety, it is incumbent upon officials to search for long-term residential arrangements such as adoption that best promote the long-term welfare of the child. Ideally, state officials should take into account the child's own preferences, the existence of family, cultural and um, ethnic background, and the availability of, um, of different options in determining what is an um, appropriate place where the child will uh, flourish. Refugees, of course, are um, only sometimes children, but they are always effectively wards of the international community. And it is perfectly reasonable for them to seek asylum in a place where they deem they're likely to uh, flourish. It's not even ridiculous to uh, suggest, I think, that states have a responsibility where practicable to facilitate their um, settlement within such places. Certainly it is dubious for them to criticise refugees if they seek out such places. And that's well. Thanks. So now we move on to the final speaker, Sarah Fang. Thank you. Good evening. So I've long been a student of political philosophy and this together the examination of two realms, the political and the philosophical, which both think of themselves as very complicated. So politics is supposedly very complicated because it deals with human beings whose behaviour is difficult to comprehend and to predict, 
And it deals with human events and institutions, which are made up of various complex layers of interests and motivations. It's a realm of unintended consequences, where good intentions may end up making things much, much worse. And philosophy is very complicated because there always seems to be a compelling counter-argument. Because good examples seem to pull in different directions, and because our intuitions sometimes conflict. So for almost every question in political philosophy, we'll find that there are various reasonable, compelling, but competing answers. Because it's all very complicated, after all. But every now and then, something happens which seems to cut through these complications. Sometimes, things aren't very complicated at all. This was the case when the world set eyes on the photograph of three-year-old Aylan Kurdi's lifeless body washed up on a Turkish beach. Suddenly, the fog lifted, and the moral requirements seemed blindingly obvious. <coughs> There was widespread realisation, at least in that moment, that whatever else, refugees <coughs> shouldn't be dying avoidably in their attempt to cross into Europe. And today I'm going to argue that even though lots of things in politics and philosophy are very complex, sometimes we should resist the temptation to complicate and to qualify. Sometimes the answers are quite clear. Not always, of course. Sometimes. And in the current crisis, there's plenty of room for discussion about appropriate responses, but there's also a call for the recognition of some straightforward requirements. So first, the simple bit. Honestly, philosophers can do simple. Here's a pertinent example. In 1972, Peter Singer published what became one of the most widely cited philosophy papers of the 20th century. Famine, affluence, and morality, as it was called, is set against the backdrop of another refugee crisis. The opening paragraph describes a humanitarian emergency unfolding in what was then East Bengal. Constant poverty, a cyclone, and a civil war have turned at least nine million people into destitute refugees, wrote Singer. People were dying, and these deaths were in no sense unavoidable. The decisions and actions of human beings, Singer added, can prevent this kind of suffering. Yet people in the wealthier countries of the world weren't doing anywhere near enough to confront the problem. The crisis unfolding in Syria in particular, spilling out into the rest of the region and beyond, is comparable in its magnitude to the one that Singer described in 1972. Singer, a utilitarian for whom the moral status of an action depends on the goodness or badness of its consequences, laid out the following principle. If it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. In practice, this principle would be seriously demanding. The only thing that would get us off the hook from the requirement to prevent something bad from happening, which is in our power to prevent, is that it would thereby require us to, to sacrifice something of comparable moral importance. But what is of comparable moral importance to preventing, say, the deaths of millions of people? Presumably not a very long list of things. And certainly not many of the things that most of us think it is permissible to do, even when we could be preventing serious harms by doing something else. But Singer also provides us with a weaker, more qualified version of the principle. If it's in our power to prevent something very bad from happening, without thereby sacrificing anything morally significant, we ought morally to do it. This is weaker, because now we might get a pass when the cost of preventing something very bad is the sacrifice of something morally significant. And that would mean that a far more extensive list of things would compete with the demand to prevent very bad things. Singer hooks us in here with a compellingly simple example of how the principle arrives in practice, and every philosophy student knows this example very well. If I'm walking past a shallow pond and see a child drowning in it, I ought to wade in 
and pull the child out. This will mean getting my clothes muddy, but this is insignificant, while the death of the child would presumably be a very bad thing. While children are drowning in significant numbers not very far from here, we all acknowledge, don't we, that this is a very bad thing, and that in some sense it's in our power to prevent it. And also it looks as though we are, in effect, walking past in our nice clean clothes. Should we be intervening to prevent avoidable death since we can, and seemingly without sacrificing anything morally significant? Now I want to argue, whatever we might think about the general principle, that if it's in our power to prevent something very bad from happening, without thereby sacrificing anything morally significant, we ought morally to do it. Whatever we think of that, it's uncontroversial that in the specific example Singer offers of the drowning child, he's absolutely right that we ought to rescue the child, even at the expense of dirtying our clothes. In that case, we can see very clearly what we ought to do. So while we might disagree quite vehemently about how far we can generalise from this example to make broader claims about our duties to prevent bad things from happening, and while we might think that the general principle is a radical oversimplification of the demands of morality, nonetheless the rescue case seems quite straightforward and difficult to deny. We ought to save the drowning child. I think we can also see that the case of refugees drowning nearby is so similar as to compel us to conclude that we, here and now, should be doing far more to prevent the drowning of refugees close to our shores. They're in urgent need of our assistance and we must and can offer that. We can do it by increasing our commitment to resourcing search and rescue missions, but we also need to think very carefully, as Catherine mentioned, about the factors driving people to risk their lives in this way. And one obvious factor is that refugees are prevented from gaining access to Europe by safe legal routes. And if we're serious about preventing these avoidable deaths, then we must tackle legal barriers to entry too. That seems simple to me. The rest looks less simple, and I don't want to suggest otherwise. Nothing's gained by complicating what's simple, but similarly nothing is gained by simplifying what's complicated. The current crisis is obviously multifaceted, and rescuing those whose lives are at risk on route to Europe is just one part of the required response. Beyond that clear case of urgent rescue, things are more complicated. First of all, as obviously Maya knows well, the world isn't short of humanitarian crises and daily emergencies which demand our attention and resources, and we need to think not just about how to approach this one, but others too. Furthermore, many responses will be akin to just papering over the cracks when what's really required is to tackle problems in a deeper and more lasting way. And this will mean big, bold, difficult, costly, structural changes. In addition, we're not lone actors. The world's made up of states and other entities with many billions of people, and in lots of cases, the most appropriate response will depend on what others are doing too. The current situation remains a crisis, not least because of the following factors. Obviously, the ongoing conflict in Syria. The fact that countries in the region are bearing the heaviest and indeed an unsustainable burden in terms of housing refugees from the conflict. And there's the situation in Europe where frontline countries are bearing the heaviest and possibly also unsustainable burdens in terms of receiving asylum seekers from the region. Those are just some of the factors. So we also know that the following things are going to be part of any appropriate response to the crisis resettling refugees from the region and or offering other routes towards admission, relocating asylum seekers already in Europe, providing aid, for example, to improve conditions for refugees in camps and assist the countries in the region bearing the heaviest burdens, and action, like political action, to tackle the root causes of the ongoing conflict. Now, as we've heard, countries like to decide which of these responses they'll focus on and which ones they'll ignore, and our government has preferred to focus on aid and on military action, and is very reluctant, as we know, to resettle refugees from the region or to relocate asylum seekers already in Europe. So the next question is, is it reasonable for governments to pick and choose in this way? And like Matthew, I think there are two sets of reasons to think it's not. First, I think 
we need to consider the fact that a refugee crisis ultimately demands at least one particular determinate response. There are some areas of international policy in which countries should be free to choose how they'd like to respond, but I think we can see that refugee crises aren't those kinds of areas. This is because, as Matthew has argued in his work, refugees are distinguished by their need for the protection of a new state. Providing aid or taking military action may or may not do some good, but it doesn't directly respond to the specific needs of refugees who need a new state of residence and an opportunity to start rebuilding an ordinary and decent life. Second, there are reasons relating to fairness, which are also connected to the issue of appropriate responses. Since refugees have a specific set of urgent needs, they can't be neglected, and this means that they will have to step in, and sometimes those nearest will be called on to act immediately, and may have to shoulder a disproportionate share of the burden. But those who are able should share the burden. Why? Well, some of the answers will relate directly to fairness. For example, we might be concerned about fairness to the nearby countries, to frontline European countries, to the refugees themselves, or to residents of those states with large refugee populations. And there might be broader fairness arguments about living in community with others and taking on a share of the burdens of community life. So once refugees are in a safe place, say Greece, there may be a very good argument for relocating or resettling some of them to other countries in order to share this burden more fairly. And there may, may be good arguments for providing a collective response at the shore which draws on the resources of European countries. Some of these arguments relate directly to fairness, say to the Greeks or to the refugees and to other interested parties. But there are also broader arguments about fairness within the European Union. But there might also be reasons why fair shares are important, as Matthew mentioned, that aren't directly related to fairness itself. For example, there are motivational issues. If other countries don't step up, can we really expect the people in the border countries to continue performing the relevant role without end? Or indeed, to contribute to, to help in future international crises? So in short, the matters are more complicated here. But it's not okay to insist on responding in our own favoured way, if our own favoured way isn't an adequate response to the given situation. And performing well on one dimension doesn't absolve a country of its responsibilities along other dimensions, in particular when the need is urgent and can only be tackled directly by appropriate and agreed upon measures. So to conclude, politics and philosophy can be very complicated, but sometimes actually things are quite clear for the eye to see. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks to everyone on the panel for that interesting, multifaceted perspective. I'm going to save applause for now and go to questions. We've got someone with a microphone who's going to come around. Um, so, if you have a question, can I ask you to keep it short and to say who you are at the very beginning? So there's someone right at the top there. Uh, hi, I'm Simon. I just graduated from SARS. I just had a question for Sarah. I, I found your talk very interesting, but I wonder whether um, uh, our starting point is very important and we might not simply, as the West, be um, uh, an, an adult walking past a shallow pond with a child drowning in it. We might be an adult who had a hand in pushing that child into the pond through our involvement in the Iraq War and, um, and you know, French colonial history in Syria, and now we're standing on the edge of the pond, splashing water over them with the bombs that we're dropping on them. So I wonder whether, I agree that it's, it's useful for us not to try and get like, too bogged down in a completely you know, overly nuanced argument in how to respond, but maybe it's not just about how adequate and moral our response can be. We also need to look at the fact that we are not a separate unit from what's going on. We've been historically involved in it. And I think that's a, maybe a first step, you know. It seems stupid to be sitting, uh, sitting aside and saying we need to have a history lesson before we go and deal with the migration crisis, but I think it's probably <laughs> one of the things that needs to happen. Um, I wonder what you thought about that. So there's a duty not to harm, not just the duty to assist in the first place. Um, Sarah, do you want to say? Yeah. No, I think you should. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I mean, of course, there are many more layers. I use 
So the argument isn't supposed to be, hey, we don't need to think of the causes, we don't need to think of the ways in which we're implicated, we don't need to think of our responsibilities. We might have many, many more responsibilities than the ones I've highlighted there. But I was just wanting to say some things we can all agree on, and this is one of them. Wouldn't the leader of the question is point in the sense that it's if you're looking for what's least controversial, the less controversial claim is you must harm people in the first place. And the claim that you must assist people here in Dallas Straits. it often does cut through the argument. I think Sarah has a, you know, started with a kind of a very powerful example. The, the boy who kind of um, washed up on, um, on the beach. Um, which was a, you know, a very emotive picture. And I don't think that's kind of connected to our causal responsibility of any harms directly. I think people just saw, you know, a child there. And I think a lot of arguments, I mean, I agree with you in the sense that it would be better if we all started to think about the consequences of our actions. But I think if we want to motivate kind of responsibility in the first instance, then we're just going to get caught up here in a causal debate about whether we caused it or um, whether we didn't cause it. Now, you have a stronger argument with, say, something like Iraq and the, inve um, and the intervention of various countries. But the argument quickly extends in the hands of many people to the Western economic order and things like that. And then it does become really quite complicated. So I would still say that, even though I can see your point as well, I don't think it cuts through things in the way that you hope it might. Yeah, um, just to add to that, I mean, I agree with what Matthew and Sarah said about um, the usefulness of just clarifying the basis of moral obligation. But I think when we look historically at the situations in which states could, did come together and cooperate around refugee protection, um, it's just interesting to note that it was often because of a sense of complicity or responsibility in the predicament of the refugees. So even if we think in the sort of moral universe that those arguments are messier, I think understanding them as motivational factors can be, at least it's just interesting and important. So, if you look at the Indo-Chinese crisis, you had the US as the lead country of resettlement. Uh, some people frame it as very much you know, a Cold War history too, because you had people fleeing you know, the communist Vietnam and other countries in the region, and so we felt a sense of affinity with the people leaving. So some of those things you might want to say, well, that's kind of morally repugnant to privilege people that you share values with over other, others when we're talking about basic human needs and rights. But, but I think understanding the more kind of complex sense of responsibility would be, I think it, it should be part of the discussion. But I think as Matthew says, the difficulty is it quickly then becomes very contested because we don't have a sense of agreement about that anymore and we obscure our own responsibility. So if we even look at Libya, I mean, it's quite clear, at least to, in my mind, that the botched intervention in Libya is part of the reason why the smuggling route from Libya to Italy is the one where most people die because these are you know, entirely ruthless smugglers who have no regard for human life. Um, so, you know, there are also good smugglers in the world. We don't do much to facilitate humanitarian smuggling these days, although the Supreme Court of Canada just said that criminalizing humanitarian smuggling is uh, unconstitutional, so to, that's a bit of a digression. But I guess, you know, even in cases where I think our recent complicity or our recent actions have created some of the problematic features. We don't get that figuring very much in the political debate. So, and, and there seems to be a, that real disjuncture between what we've done before and the, the kind of things that I think kind of fairly uncontroversially we seem to have caused. Um, so I would like it to be more relevant to the moral debate, but I fear that it, it does muddy the waters in practice. I think the next question is over here, but before we come to that, do you want to add? Maya, to what's been said. Just really quickly, that I would agree that it does it it forces us to, to confront um, 
Europe's responsibility, complicity in some of these conflicts, um, but I don't think it's necessarily the argument that's actually going to get cut through when we're calling for a more progressive asylum policy, but absolutely accept, accept the point, and we see it in the con continuation of the arms trade, or who, who, who is more responsible for climate change. Um, so it's, it perhaps can force us to confront that, that argument. All right, thanks. Abel, a graduate from Uppsala University. Uh, my question is for Katrin. Recently, there was an article on Al Jazeera on which they decided that they're not going to use the word migrant and they're going to refer all uh, people crossing the Mediterranean refugees. And some argue that it is a deliberate uh, statement or a deliberate decision by Al Jazeera or by the Qatar government to to give an image that all migrants crossing the Mediterranean and refugees and uh, Europe has a responsibility to uh, accept them as refugees. And I was wondering, what do you make of their decision to call all of them refugees? Thanks. Um, I mean, I guess legally it seems implausible because we know that at least some of the people won't be recognized legally as refugees. So if we're using a legal definition of refugees, But I also think the BBC position of obscuring the refugee issues is also inaccurate, if I'm looking at it as a lawyer. But I suppose there's something else I'd add into that discussion. I mean, I'm not sure that legal language should colonize our moral universe. So, so if Al Jazeera wants to make a point that people are in a refugee-like predicament, otherwise you wouldn't undergo that journey, fair enough. I mean, it's an editorial policy. They can take an editorial line, just as the BBC has taken I, don't, I, I actually often feel quite uncomfortable with the extent to which legal categories, especially on this issue, you know, are kind of colonize the moral universe. And I think that's especially dangerous when it comes to the situation of people who are deemed not to have international protection needs, which is the nice technical phrase for people whose asylum claims get rejected. And I think sometimes that includes people whose asylum claims are wrongly rejected are refugees within the legal definition. But often it's other people who have all sorts of acute human needs or things to contribute or, you know, but their humanity is sort of obscured in this non-refugee category. Um, and I suppose to the extent that you can, you know, undermine the kind of hegemonic nature sometimes of legal categories, I'm, I'm quite happy with a world in which Al Jazeera takes a different line to the BBC. Once it's explained, and then we can be aware of these Anyone else want to speak about legal colonization? <laughs> <laughs> the way you set it up. Huh? I, I mean, what I would just point out, and coming back a little bit to what I was talking about before about the, the kind of normative definition of refugee, the non legal one, is that interestingly enough, public understandings of what a refugee is are much broader than the legal one. People would include a whole range of people, certainly from all sorts of indiscriminate conflict, just fleeing for their lives when the refugee convention definition kind of, um, I suppose, cuts it, um, cuts it down. And in a funny way, then governments pick it up and then just define it, into, often sometimes just define it narrowly in terms of the convention definition um, uh, sense, um, sense of a refugee, but I think just underlying the surface there in public understandings is actually quite an inclusive understanding of who a refugee is. So is the thought that the public understanding is refugee status is the right to claim asylum, but the grounds on which you could claim it is much broader than the legal yeah, grounds? that's right, yes. I think people think of fleeing to save their lives, and you can flee to face it um, save your life and not necessarily be a convention definition of refugee. Can I come back? I mean, I would challenge that a bit because I do think there's this narrative being created now of refugee good, migrant mm. bad. And if you're moving to Europe because you're fleeing indignity mm. or poverty or climate change, your, your livelihoods are no longer sustainable, then you're not deserving of our sympathy or compassion. But migrant or refugee, you have you have basic rights that need to be upheld and you have needs that need to be upheld. And also that distinction is breaking down. So if you're somebody who's coming from the Sahel region of West Africa, 
and you've taken this very dangerous route to get to Europe and you've been abused on the way and you arrive at Europe desperate and you've lost all your resources, then how should you be treated? So I'm not saying we should revisit the Refugee Convention, but I think the starting point has to be um, one that of, of compassion, irrespective of, you know, of, of, of the motive, because otherwise we do fall into, into these traps of good versus bad. And that's already playing out in our response to the crisis in, in Europe. So did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, th there's a, a now famous uh, philosophy article on, on who is a refugee mm. by um, somebody called Chateau. And one of the lines that he has in that article is that, um, interestingly enough, a refugee status is a sort of privileged status insofar as there are lots of people who would like to be able to claim this status but don't count according to the convention um, definition. And this means that they don't, uh, they, they can't claim the sorts of rights associated with being a refugee. Um, so while I think it is very important to maintain the idea of what's distinctive about the particular needs of refugees, and I think this comes out very much in Matthew's work, while I think that's very important, I think that it's also equally important to try to undermine the rhetoric that Maya was talking about, refugee good, migrant bad. And I think some of the emphasis on trying to call this a refugee crisis and focus on the idea that we're talking about refugees actually has the effect of uh, delegitimizing the claims of people who don't count uh, as refugees or who are not given the status of refugee or who don't have the status of refugee. And I'm perfectly fine with the idea of calling it, say, a migrant crisis, if that's to say, we're recognizing that the people involved have very urgent needs that need to be addressed, and like Maya says, to treat everybody with a kind of humanitarian concern. Yeah, so I mean, what we're seeing here are two potential strategies, aren't there? One could be just to try to get at what a refugee is and expand through that mm -hmm. to encompass an awful lot of people. Or, alternatively, just to problematise this very distinction between the refugee and the economic migrant so that you make us rethink just who an economic migrant is mm -hmm. in some ways. So, you, so we take out this sense that they're people that don't have needs or don't have entitlement. Or well, there might be a third strand, which is you keep the distinction but recognise that just because you're not a refugee it doesn't mean that moral requirements or obligations fall away. They might have a different set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? I, say, I think we should do away with the term economic migrant. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to, to say there's a distinction between refugees and migrants. But economic migrant <coughs> really has become a term of abuse, hasn't it? It's a way of people saying these people don't have legitimate needs. They're, they're the kind of people who can be dispensed with and they're the target of lots of kind of, um, for example, conservative party rhetoric. These people are just economic migrants. So why not do away with that term? Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm Joshua. I'm, I'm studying uh, in an MSc in political theory. So my question is targeted towards the, the man who talked about the political theory and the woman who talked about the right. facts. And I don't know your names, but. So um, we're seeing a, 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 a rise in <coughs> you know, nativist um, candidates in America, in France, parties, you know, the Front National in France and uh, throughout Western Europe. And so there's this real discrepancy <coughs> between um, a, a very strong theoretical um, justification for welcoming migrants. And it's not even a justification, it's, a, it's an urgent need, it's an impetus, it's, you know, we need to do it now and we need to do it heavily. And a, a, a political reality of people who democratically exercise their sovereignty to deny other people their humanitarian, I don't know if it's a right, but their humanitarian need for, you know, coming into Western countries. Um, and so my question is the very traditional question in political theory, to what extent must or can political theory inform uh, the practice and politics and how do we kind of, you know, in front of this, um, block situation of people exercising their rights and denying other people's the, the, their, their quest for, for refugee seeking. How do, how do we get beyond that point? How do we actually make um, the need and the, the, the urgency of political, of, of um, refugee seekers uh, translate into practice? And so to what extent should theory affect practice? 
to the extent that she was correct. I mean, um, sorry, is that the quick? <coughs> I mean, so the question is, to what extent should the only have it? Can it? The oh, can can it, it is quite different. I thought it was can it. Well, presumably it's correct when we're talking about so oh, that would be can but, it. Well, I mean, I think can it, I suppose, is to provide us with a sense of what we ought to do. So, um, so we kind of aim to try to get close to that. But I think political theory is quite limited, actually, in its ability to, um, um, to generate political change in and of itself. So I'm a little bit pessimistic about that. The hope, I suppose, is that um, by talking about duties, by talking about obligations, by encouraging people to think about those, you inspire members of the public, you inspire activists, you inspire um, political leaders to identify a set of values that they think are worthwhile trying to realize in the world and mobilize people around. And I think that's possible. But I don't think the ideas on their own, you know, on their own are enough. They have to be connected, obviously, to some political movement, to some uh, form of, um, I suppose, political leadership as well. And I suppose that's what we hope in the midst of something like what we're seeing in Europe, what, what we've seen a lack of, particularly in this country, is political leaders that are even trying to do uh, something that most people on this table, would, uh, I mean, most people on this table at least, would recognize as um, morally acceptable. Trying to push, for example, for some kind of coordination across states to deal with this crisis in the realm of asylum. Rather, in this country, we've seen the opposite. So, I mean, you can point to um, the Prime Minister who referred to asylum seekers as swarms. Uh, you can look at the general tenor of discussion that comes from our Home Secretary. It actually pushes in the opposite direction. So it's not, it's not a perfect answer, but I've never seen political theory as actually, in and of itself, a great vehicle for change. Though it might be that crises force mistaken political theories into the fray. Well, that's, a lot of mistakes. well, that's an interesting point because people then, in the midst of crises, in the midst when the normal assumptions start breaking down, may start looking for different ways to look at the world and different ways to capture support in that context to deal with the changing reality. That is absolutely true, but others clearly yeah, yes. um, Well, I know that Catherine has something very interesting to say about your point. Um, about um, exercising democratic rights versus the uh, rights of refugees. So I'll just, that you can Yeah, no, yeah. just about the xenophobic rights. Yeah. So, so it just, this isn't so much a point about theory, but it kind of, because um, what, what do you get by having a sense of political structures and institutions and their shortcomings? So if you even glance at the way we've organized political communities, and we can see this in the practice of politics, you have basically governments who are accountable to their electorates. And usually in the electorate you have an undifferentiated middle and some xenophobes on the right and then the refugee loving people like the people on the panel. And one of the difficulties to, to caricature obviously the whole situation and one of the difficulties is that because refugees and migrants are outsiders and are unenfranchised, electoral politics tends to swing to the xenophobic right because there's nothing in it electorally, usually. Um, I mean, this is very crude, but you know, in, in supporting refugees and migrants, with some exceptions if you have diaspora groups or if you can form a common cause. So, so I guess that gives us a sense that, you know, even although we can acknowledge that there are all of these very strong ethical duties and they've been reaffirmed in law over and over again, and that in and of itself should be an independent reason states to act in accordance with their existing obligations. Um, we have an institutional problem. So, so I think that can give us a way of reframing what happens in the political realm and, and being more sort of, I guess having, and then, and then it is about social movements as, as Matthew was saying. Um, but I think the most heartening part of the current crisis is the civil society swing. And we can see it in the UK, I think, in the way that, the way that discussion about Calais has been reframed. I mean, a few years ago, as we, I mean, in my perception, uh, the sorts of people who went to Calais and thought that Calais was 
you know, a British concern, tended to be sort of open borders activists. Um, whereas nowadays, you know, it is a place where church groups visit, send aid. There are schools all over the UK who are gathering materials. Now you could say that's mawkish and there's something very sentimental about this, but on the other hand, there is a sense of responsibility that Calais wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the British border in France. So that is a change which has come about, which is broadening the scope of moral responsibility. So to you, Sarah's and Singer's sort of uh, example, you know, the question in the drowning child is, are we just walking by? So there is an assumption of proximity naturally in Singer's example, and so this is all, but to me that's really the key question, is what is the scope of our responsibility? Is it for refugees from Burma who are drowning in, also in other parts of the world that are less proximate to us? And I guess, I suppose, I suppose the point I was making, but it maybe doesn't directly answer your question, is that if we have a sense of the way the institutions that we've set up don't allocate our moral and even legal responsibilities appropriately, that can be the beginning of actually new forms of political action and institution building across borders. And in a way, the EU is supposed to be the exemplar of this. So when it disappoints, it always disappoints me so bitterly when the EU doesn't work, because it's meant to be the, I mean, it's the only transnational, non-state, quasi-democratic, you know, international body that we have. And so when it fails, that's, I think, doubly or triply disappointing. Yeah. More questions? Yes. Um, so I uh, don't go in there. I haven't even got an A-levels or anything, so I'm sorry if it sounds a bit daft. But um, you've been talking about a lot Britain's responsibility in this, and Britain's institution, Britain's view of all of this problem, us in Europe and out, us in the European continent, but also separate. And at the same time, you've been speaking about from Oxfam, you can see a view from the people on the ground who are going through this crisis. And but how much have we influenced the institutions that we've built in those kind of countries where we have had strong uh, historical ties? You know, the bonds we've had strong ties to Nigeria and Kenya and India. We essentially helped to build up their political systems and. Those are now the countries that are actually making the most profit. Those are the countries that are making the most progress. And Britain has had a part in that from our old colonial days, we have. But now we've sort of left the whole world. After World War II, the empire fell, and we kind of moved out and did all of this uh, UNHRC thing. But uh, there's something like, according to the UN, like 50 or more ongoing conflicts in the world. And wars or whatever you want to call them, secular like disagreements or religious, it's something that has had a lot of um, a lot of not just impact but causes because of British, you know, just sitting around in the lecture theatre having a natter about this instead of actually doing something. And I was kind of wondering what, in the place of, you know, we have these two things which is we're trying to decide in Europe what to do about these people who don't have homes, and we're trying to bomb the uh, Syrians, because apparently that's a good idea, and I don't know, that's up to you guys, but, um, and we're trying to help the aid organizations, so that's like three things we're trying to do, but how much is that actually going to help in the long run if we try and conform to the same institutions that we've already had? <coughs> so charity, uh, Oxfam, legally, if we're trying to change the terminology, uh, politically, if we're just going to consider what we could do. Um, I'm kind of asking, is there anything more that we haven't approached or trying to, you know, we're just trying to frame the issue. Is there any way it hasn't been already framed? Who wants to take that question? So? with uh, an institutional backdrop that has its failings will produce yet further problems in different ways that we, it, it's difficult to anticipate. So I completely agree. And I, I'll, I'll say, I'll link this to, the, to my answer to the previous question um, 
role for political theory and how political theory should um, try to influence politics. Um, because I was thinking in response to that question that I see political theory fundamentally and primarily as a critical exercise, um, as, as an attempt to question the assumptions that um, form the backdrop of our age, the kinds of things that we take for granted, um, as an attempt to understand the way in which power relations dramatically advantage and disadvantage different groups of people. And so I'm always worried about the kind of political theory that comes out defending the status quo. I don't know how that kind of political theory happens. It's called so conservatism. In, so, uh, <laughs> so inevitably, inevitably, the kind of political theory that is deeply critical, that does point to these, these um, uh, unequal power relations and the kinds of disadvantages that they impose on marginalized people, inevitably that's not incredibly influential in political circles, but I think it has this very important critical role. So the role relates to this question about institutional background. I think that we should be very critical about the institutions that we have already, and we should be able to be thinking through different kind of institutional options. It's very difficult, but that is an important project. Maybe this connects a bit with what you were saying about the EU. Yeah, and I, I was going to say, I mean, because you were, as you sketched it out, we have created various sets of international institutions. And so we have uh, lots of different ways in which military organizations cooperate. And the way Matthew was able to use Cameron's quote saying we have to assist one another militarily, obviously states have alliances and we have structures like NATO and some military cooperation at the EU level. So to me, it was just very striking that we can coordinate, we in this instance being the EU and the international level by going to the UN Security Council to get a resolution which doesn't allow states to do all that much more than they can do under existing anti-smuggling law, but just to make the claim and convince the international community that human smuggling is a threat to international peace and security. So the first time in history, so something genuinely unprecedented, and the EU spent a lot of its moral capital trying to get that resolution through, which allows new forms of action in the context of the search and rescue, which we agree is morally necessary. Mm. So really muddying the practice there. Um, so military, you know, there's all of this kind of apparatus that facilitates cooperation, and it's so expensive. I mean, eye-wateringly expensive. The amounts of money that humanitarians would dream of get spent through military the con military context. So I think your, in your intuition is just really correct. That we have to compare the you know things that are impossible in the humani humanitarian sector get done through military means. And we have different ways of framing things, saying similar problems, and then they trigger a whole cascade of different institutional responses. So I think being alive to those different contexts is really important. We started a little bit late, so I'm going to allow just one final question very quickly before we begin, so we can have the microphone come down. Um, if you could put your question uh, succinctly, please, and then we'll wait. Sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for holding such an important event, and at the same time, all the presenters. Um, I am from Eritrea, and uh, Eritrea is one that is uh, producing the highest number after Syria of refugees. And um, that is because we have a dictator uh, who is carrying out human rights violations that have been defined by the Commission of Inquiry appointed by the uh, high, um, high Commissioner uh, as almost genocide. Now, on the other hand, we see that the European obviously uh, UK, um, to stop the high flow of refugees are allocating some funds to these uh, countries like Eritrea. In fact, the gentleman had mentioned about two billion, and in fact more, because it has to be matched by others. Eritrea has been allocated because, uh, due to the cartoon process, 200 million, which is literally not much, but it's going to take a slice of the two billion and more, 
what is your reaction to this? Is there any way that legally, considering also, Christine, if I may ask you, uh, the cotton agreement, is that something that could be used to uh, defy all this? Thank right. you. I think that this is, thank you. Thank you for making those points. It's what, it's what I was getting at in my, in, in my presentation, the way development assistance is now being used to limit mobility, to incentivize deals with countries like Sudan and Eritrea that have very, very dubious human rights records in order to prevent people from coming to Europe. And that is what played out very recently when the EU and African heads of state met in Valletta in Malta to discuss this issue. And they put a big trust fund on the table. You know, and the words in public around, you know, were around development and human rights and resilience. But we know that there were many behind the scenes discussions where African states showed best practice and how they controlled their borders. And that some of that money, which I think in our view should be used to fight poverty, is now being put into border controls and securitization and smuggling. So it's a very worrying trend that needs to be aired and it needs to be resisted. Um, but it kind of goes back to some of the points that we've already made around what is that, you know, what is driving um, different states' responses to this crisis, and it's it's a concern to build their borders and the whole concept of fortress Europe that we need to that we do need to address. But I think where I'd end on a more hopeful note, because I think someone spoke about the rise of the right, there has also been this this outpouring of solidarity um, and and citizen activism in response to the refugee crisis. And it's been very interesting to see it from the Oxfam perspective where you have these small groups going direct to Calais, direct to Greece to help. And that's something that um, you know, we need to get behind, and it's the countervailing force and it's the countervailing narrative that we don't hear as much. I'm tempted to stop at this hopeful point, unless yeah. someone really wants to, or has an even more hopeful no, point. I, no, I didn't have a hopeful point. <laughs> 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 you have to, to be an optimist in this no, business. I, 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 I would really like to finish on the hopeful <laughs> point. So I'm not Do you have a hopeful point, Catherine? No, but it was maybe just to answer very directly okay. the Eritrea okay. question, because I think we can distinguish situations where it's certainly undesirable for money to be given to countries to contain refugees, for example. So if we look at EU Turkey, but that might have some benign outcomes. I think the EU could have negotiated much harder on the right to work in Turkey, for example. Um, and there'll be cases in the middle where giving money to regimes that are not, don't have great human rights records, but are sort of okay, where you could say, well, the aid books don't do some good, but I'm sure you know the details much better than I do, but from what I've read about particularly EU aid to Eritrea, it does seem there's at least some enough evidence to be very concerned about the use of aid in projects where there's forced labor and severe human rights violations in government projects that are funded by EU aid. At least enough, from what I've read, and it's not my area of expertise, but enough to think that that should at least be properly Um, Mr. Chairman, will you allow me just very shortly? Um, Since I have the microphone, I will take it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, since, uh, for example, there is a chance that we might not be able to um, stop the funds going home, but at least can we, as engaged citizens, and this is through the floor, ask our government here to, uh, for accountability for how it's going to be spent. We can contact all our MPs of our constituencies and ask for accountability of the funds that are going to regimes like uh, the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've been very fortunate, I think, to have panelists who have brought out the complexities of this issue, but also to remind us that sometimes there are certain things that are just plain obvious. So can we just thank you.